Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to this number six of the Data Drivers Hackathons. And for those of you watching at home, this is the final hackathon of the series. And uh, my name is Corey Minton. I'm a strategist at Splunk, and I'm super excited to welcome Kyle, a fellow strategist at Splunk, to the broadcast. Kyle, how are we doing today? I'm doing well. How are you, man? I'm awesome. Ready to have some fun. Uh, this has been an exciting adventure that we've called Data Drivers. For those of you who are just tuning in, this is uh, a series where we get to do some really fun things around racing and hacking. So let's get into it. So first of all, you may be asking yourself, what exactly is Data Drivers? Well, for those of you, this is your first time tuning in or as a recap, this is a series where we go racing uh, because racing's fun, but we do it in uh, simulators. So racing simulators using the iRacing.com platform. Um, but racing by itself is fun, but it's not all that interesting for those of us who are trying to, you know, learn technology and want to dig into the data. But as it turns out, iRacing gives us access to a data gold mine. And so we actually use the data that we create during the data drivers races. And we use those to host these hackathons where we give you hands on access to Splunk's observability and IT uh, tools to actually go extract value from the data created in racing to help bring value to McLaren's Shadow Esports team. So if you haven't joined us yet, we'll put the we'll drop the link here shortly in the uh, chat that, that would give you access to our Discord channel and how you can uh, participate with us. Now, when you're thinking about participation, clearly this is a meant to be a very hands-on activity and hopefully most of you who are uh, watching this have actually registered and you have access to the lab environments that we've created. Um, if you registered using that QR code, we do invite you to a Discord channel um, where you could have gone racing with us. But most importantly for today, it's all about the hackathon access. Um, and if you are just watching, that is totally OK. We think you'll actually get some value in seeing how we extract data from iRacing and expose and drive insights using Splunk. There's totally some useful tidbits here for you, especially when we get our subject, ma subject matter expert on for today. Now. Those of you who are Splunk fans, and I'm guessing that's most of you who are watching this channel, you probably know that Splunk.conf is our annual user conference, and it is easily my favorite week of the year. Kyle, I don't know about you. Conf, kind of great? Oh, it's great. You know, it's, it's always a good time to see fellow Splunkers and people surrounding uh, this community get together and see their ideas and, and what they've been up to over the past year, and, and in this case, two years. Uh, so it's... Uh, yeah, I'm real pumped for it. <laughs> I'm and probably the most exciting thing for us uh, is that we do, as of now, have the plan that this is both a virtual conference and an in-person conference. So we're absolutely going to have an in-person experience in Las Vegas, uh, you know, obviously following all the necessary safety guidelines and doing everything, um, you know, appropriate based on local authorities. Uh, but anything that we can do to make sure that we get there in person, it's always a great experience. And I'll buy you something other than a maybe a Topo Chico if I find you at one of the uh, the local haunts at Las Vegas. Um, but definitely sign up, conf.splunk.com. And again, I'll drop the link in the notes here shortly. But definitely sign up. We've got a lot of activities planned around data drivers. So if you're into racing, you probably know Splunk is a sponsor of McLaren. And uh, we're going to have some fun with, uh, some fun with that sponsorship, I'll say. Now, one of the other things that is uh, super great about uh, .conf is our BOSS program. So BOSS program uh, is made up of two uh, key games, if you will. It's uh, BOSS of the SOC and BOSS of Ops and Observability. So BOSS of Ops and Observability used to be called BOSS of the NOC, but now because IT has grown way out of the NOC and we're starting to see observability matter to so many audiences, we've rebranded and we're going to have a brand new version of Boo out for the comp participants, both the online virtual folks and the folks who join us in person, get to compete in a gamified experience to use Splunk to solve some really interesting challenges. So very excited about that. And for those of you who are into data drivers, maybe you got to play with some of the data, maybe you didn't. We're actually going to have two episodes in the Boo program uh, around data drivers to get you hands on with even new questions, some data sets that we haven't exposed in the hackathon. So it's all going to be new to you. So looking forward to that. And Kyle, I think we should get a big data beard team and see if we can compete and win. I don't know. Yeah, I uh, I won't hold our breath, but you know, we'll, we'll see how far we get. And uh, hey, the point of it is to have fun and learn something new. And I, I think we can do that with these games. So yeah, let's give it a shot. <laughs> Absolutely. 
So yeah, the uh, today you're here for the hackathon uh, and the hackathon format. If you're not familiar with the other five uh, episodes of this, is we start with a challenge introduction. You can think of this as our idea of what we're going to solve today. Uh, we'll then go to a McLaren Shadow esports perspective. And today we have the one and only Blake Reynolds providing some insights for us, which is always a good time to chat with him. So uh, then we'll give a bit of a technical overview from one of our subject matter experts. And I'm particularly excited today for our expert uh, online hanging out in our virtual backstage area. Uh, and then we'll open it up to some collaborative hacking where today we'll learn a bit more about adaptive thresholding and alerting and why those matter. Uh, provide a little bit of, of a bonus challenge and what you can do in the labs as we leave them open for the next uh, little bit. And unfortunately, number six is, uh, well, it's it's kind of just looking forward at conf, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, That's right. But we do want to make sure that you stay involved in our communities. So uh, please join our Discord server. Uh, we'll keep that open uh, year round. And in there, you can ask questions, uh, you know, get some problems solved and even uh, jump in and go racing every once in a while. Corey, I know we're, uh, what was it? We were throwing around the soapbox race idea. If anybody yeah. So racing. if anybody watches iRacing, like the, the updates, they just added the Mount Washington hill climb race, which is yeah. it's pretty rad. So Travis Pastrana just set a, like a crazy record in his, uh, like Subaru, but what a lot of people are doing is there's this car called the Formula V. It's like the entry level open wheel car. And instead of racing up the hill, you can do it in a down configuration. And okay. so people are going up there in Formula Vs, turning off the engine and allowing gravity to take you down like a soapbox rally. Because the Formula V looks kind of like a dumpy little box yeah. anyway. And so it's uh, it's totally a way for you to like have a soapbox rally. So I think that's probably going to be a bonus episode. Although I'm excited, Kyle. I've got one for us that we're going to try to figure out how to turn it into one of these. I'm going to Barber Motorsports Park, which was the oh, yeah. site of our original, our first race in the race to, um, or excuse me, in the uh, Data Driver series. Uh, and we'll post a link here shortly to the, the YouTube channel where if you haven't seen some of these, you can go back and get those. But at any rate, I'm going to Barber in my car on Sunday for a high performance driving event. And uh, we're going to turn some video. I'm going to grab a bunch of video and we're grabbing data from my Apex Pro di digital driving coach device. And we're going to take that data and compare it in Splunk to the data from iRacing in a car that's pretty similar in power to weight ratio uh, to my car. And so we're going to call it something like uh, data drivers in real life versus the sim. So we'll see. Uh, <laughs> should be fun to stay tuned to that. So it's real life data versus uh, the streaming data we get from the game. So you're technically not gaming then. You're saving money by practicing track time in your simulator. So now, so now you get, this is exactly what I told my wife. I'm like, yeah, this is an investment that saves us money. Much like when you go and you yeah. save more money than you spent because you had a great sale. It's the same argument. So if you don't believe in that, you can't believe in this. Just saying. Yeah. <laughs> that always goes over well, I'm sure. It, right? That does not really actually. <laughs> I fail every time. Yeah. So the uh, data to action, the, the idea of today's uh, hackathon is thresholds at speed. And through that, we are going to use ITSI to tune our KPIs and focus the alerts on situations that require, you know, different actions throughout the race. And Blake will provide a bit more. But the idea is, is, you know, you, you do want Splunk and your, your data tool to be chatty, but not too chatty. And you yeah. want it to be able to say the right things. Uh, and, and our subject matter expert can help with that. Now, if you are wanting to join as well, uh, drop us a little chat. We'll get you into our Discord server. But if you are uh, part of it already, we've got the credentials over in Discord. Uh, we've had Bristol, uh, the race that we did at Bristol, running every 30 minutes through our good friend John LaVos setting that up for us. And, uh, yeah, we're going to have our SME walk us through it. Uh, I think um, I'm excited, Corey. Are, yeah, are you I mean, I candidly, here's, what I, here's, here's what's crazy to me. We have legit in this series gone from – having no nothing like we started from basically we have a game and we have this thing called Splunk. We built a script to pull data from my racing into Splunk. We pulled the data from our windows machines into Splunk. We then started working through like real basic, like how do you surface, you know, insights into some of these metrics. And then we moved into some pretty advanced topics around using ITSI to actually build KPIs and, how do those KPIs all work together to, to give us a, a view of a service? But what we're going to do today is we're going to really take the next logical step that many of you, if you're using Splunk, 
uh, in IT and observability use cases. It's kind of the next logical step, which is cool instrumented everything. Great, I kind of had some ideas of what needed to be monitored from a KPIs perspective, but maybe you didn't do a great job of setting KPIs or maybe you didn't have, like when you were originally setting them up, you didn't have enough data and you were just kind of guessing at what the norms were. Mm -hmm. and so you may have been like overrun with alerts. Uh, and so we're going to show you some pretty pretty slick ways that the inbuilt machine learning in Splunk can help you tune those KPIs, um, how those KPIs can then be modeled to give you more useful and actionable intelligence. So excited to do that again. Everybody should be that's going to be hacking with us today has access to the uh, to the lab environment. And so we're going to uh, jump to that in just a second. But first, we want to get some perspective because we've said this all along. If y'all have been on Big Data Beard podcast or anything with us before, I'm a I'm a huge fan of, you know, tech. But tech for tech's sake is really not all that useful. We need to be able to tie it back to an outcome that we're trying to drive, a useful way that we're going to make somebody's life better, their job easier, the company more productive, right? It's impact somehow. And what we're trying to do here is impact these esports drivers that that run for uh, Shadow McLaren. And we're trying to build things that actually can help them be faster. And so Blake Reynolds is a uh, is a top performing e NASCAR pro, uh, competes in the Coca Cola e NASCAR series for Shadow McLaren, and he's going to give us some perspective on what he'd like to see from an alerts uh, point of view. So hang tight, and we'll get the video rolling. Well, we are excited to be back with another. McLaren Shadow Perspectives with our buddy Blake Reynolds. Blake, we are excited to chat with you again. During the last hackathon, we talked about uh, some things that we were building for your spotters. We learned about the team that it takes to be successful. But I'm curious, like we're working today on this idea of alerts. And I'm curious if we could alert you to something like, what would that be? What is it that we're not alerting you against today that you don't already have in iRacing that would be really interesting? So we are alerted to it, but I would like a stronger alert, I guess, in a way, either whether that be, you know, like on an Apple watch or on a separate screen with a big, bright flashing color, uh, probably be engine temp, you know, in iRacing, we have, especially in the NASCAR cars at a track like Daytona, Talladega, some of the faster two mile and mile and a half tracks. Uh, we have to worry about engine temp. We tape up our grills and we're constantly worrying about that. And, you know, sometimes we have to peek out for clean air and put it on the grill. Uh, you know, and, and then, uh, you know, the racing is so busy, especially in oval, you don't have time to look at your dash and check your temp. And even then it's this little, it, just the, the text changes red. It's okay. not uh, that big of a notification. So I'd say, you know, maybe like an Apple watch, a certain, you know, a, a pattern of output to let me know like what different like water or oil displays it or notifies me that my engine is hot or getting yeah, like somewhere close to haptic. hot. Like something yeah, haptic, so, right? Yeah, absolutely. Or a big, you know, say I have a fourth monitor up here and a big, bright, you know, purple light. It's and <laughs> big, just, just big. Let me know. Like, I do not want to miss it. <laughs> All right. So we got to find the alerts that matter to you. And actually what's interesting, we're uh, during the hackathon today, we're going to be talking about how Splunk uses some AI and machine learning to find the alerts that really are important that need action. But when I started thinking about AI and it was our conversation, it immediately made me think, I saw in the release notes and some of the later iRacing I releases, they have AI racing. Could you like just spend a second to explain like just what that is and how you would use it? Like what's the purpose of AI in iRacing? Yeah, the AI, they can be really slow or extremely fast. Uh, sometimes they can be faster than the best sets you can put you know, the slider goes all the way up to 125%. Oh, so yeah, it's, okay. it's crazy. And it's like the fastest villain. It's incredible. Exactly. Unbeatable. Gosh. You, you could say a bot. Yeah. Oh, it's an AI <laughs> bot for racing. We should, uh, we should probably splunk <laughs> our data then and see what percentage we're all at, you know, because I imagine Blake something like 120% and I'm at three. Let's say 110. 110. <laughs> yeah. Pull out set. But usually what we use AI for, especially in, uh, in you know, iRacing NASCAR, eNASCAR, uh, we test our sets uh, in dirty air. 
usually we can't oh, okay. know like Honda the cars. Yeah. yeah. Like we have a 40 car field. Oh, yeah. I can't, I can't test, but I can't get 39 people all the time and start last and know exactly what my car is going to do in full on dirty air. So that's like the number one thing that I think the AI provides to someone like me. Uh, you know, I want to test a set. I want to see if my car plows the wall down or spins out the moment, you know, I, you know, I get a difference in uh, air on the front of my race car. Yeah. Wow. And and have you noticed a lot of changing differences? Like, you know, as you're taking this data back, are you, are you seeing how those changes affect in between dirty and clean air? I, to somebody like me, I wouldn't think that that's super big deal, but it sounds like at, at the skill level that you guys operate at, that this is, you know, minuscule changes can have big effects. Is that the case? Uh, yeah. It, like for instance, last week in Michigan, a uh, big fast two mile track. Uh, I was kind of poking between two, two or three different setups. I didn't really know which one to go toward cause they all felt the same in person or by myself. Sorry. Uh, and I wanted to just see how they felt is obviously I couldn't go into a public race and show everyone my ride heights. I don't want to, yeah. I don't want to leak any secrets. So uh ai racing is perfect i can start 40th in a in a 40 car field and i can go into turn one do five laps and i can you know have the constant effects of ai on my car and then uh yeah certainly when you uh difference you know the slightest setting can really especially yeah. in iRacing i'll yeah. i'll go up half an inch of my on the left side of the track bar and just on entry i'll notice that i go from you know, I have my steering wheel here. I'll go from, you know, turning left and all of a sudden I'm, I'm turning right, 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 right. And then, <laughs> and then I, I wreck, you know, just the slightest adjustment. Uh, that's a big deal. But yeah. That's, that's the number one use of AI. Definitely. Very cool. Me. Testing and research. That's awesome. Well, you know, we've had a lot of fun and I want to say a big thanks to you and to Tobin and the team at Shadow McLaren for uh, partnering with us on this. And, and I'm curious We've talked a lot about some you know interesting things that we've done with you guys. We're going to continue to be working with uh, the McLaren Shadow team, but like as part of Data Drivers, if there's things that we could be working on, the team that's joining us here, like what are some of the things that we could do next? Like the things we, I feel like we've just scratched the surface. There's more we can do. What would you think would be interesting for us to tackle next? Absolutely. Um, you know, I'd probably say maybe you know, like an AI learning build up a record of races. Um, as we get more races put into the archive or the cloud, whatever you want to call it, uh, maybe we can get something to predict race strategies mid, like mid race, say, you know, we could have 20 or 30 hundred lap races at a certain track in our archive. And then, you know, based when a caution comes out, maybe it'll tell us like two tires, four tires, like a certain yeah. gas amount. And you know, we can have all that data backed up, you know, for a long time. And that, that'd probably be something. That, uh, that we could look at. Yeah. Well, Corey, I, uh, I think we have our homework. That's right. Uh, we do. But for now, Blake, thank you so much. And, uh, we're going to jump back into the hackathon. All right. All right. Well, that is fantastic to hear from, uh, from Blake. Uh, engine temp at speed is clearly a thing. Uh, I didn't, that didn't occur to me until when he said it, I thought, do you remember when in the virtual race to dot conf, whenever we were all bundled yeah. up in the, at Daytona and I blew an engine <laughs> because I didn't realize that the engine temp would go haywire. And I certainly yeah. didn't have that alert to, uh, to be aware of it. So that makes a lot of sense to me. Dirty well, air was not something I thought like until he said it, I was I, I, I never even thought of that. Now it, it makes total sense. Yeah, that's right. Well, now it's time to welcome our esteemed guest for today, our colleague, Jeff Wiedemann, principal Hello. strategist. What's up, buddy? At, uh, at Splunk. And apparently part, is that Minotaur or Cinetar? Which one is that? That's the Minotaur. I'm, I don't, I'm really the horse's ass. I probably shouldn't say it, but that's what it is. <laughs> well, you're awesome, buddy. We're glad to have you. Jeff, if you do everybody a favor, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about what you do at Splunk. Uh, sure. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Jeff Wiedemann. 
Uh, I've been at Splunk for almost six years now. Uh, so I've moved through several different jobs uh, at the company. And uh, I find myself today as uh, one of the uh, IT operations strategists. And um, what that means in a nutshell is really kind of helping to set the strategic uh, direction from a technical perspective as to what our products do and how we do them and how we can you know best deliver value uh, to our customers. Nice, man. Well, we're excited to have you join us today as a... Uh... You, as a quick recap for before we get into the material, as a quick recap, Jeff is going to do us a huge solid, which is based on what we set up as the challenge, which is we're going to try to use ITSI to surface some actionable intelligence and alerts. Uh, Jeff's going to give us a quick rundown of the technology that's necessary for us to use in Splunk so that when we get started hands on, you sort of understand some of the terminology. So, Jeff, if it's cool with you, I'll turn it over to you to, to make some explanations for everybody. Absolutely. Sounds good. I just want to say before we get going, you guys are cracking me up in the uh, intro section there. Um, that was uh, that was some pretty good uh, comedy <laughs> material. So um, that was good. I also we're thought here, the AI. The last. Yeah, I also thought the AI, uh, you know, conversation with McLaren was really interesting. I um, I love airplanes and I'm, I'm really big into, um, you know, the uh, kind of airplane uh, crash um you know, shows, I think like seconds to disaster is one. And one of the things I see on there all the time is that they, they test a lot of situations out in the simulators. And I, I've, I've always found that to be really interesting. You know, how in the world do they, uh, you know, create all of the different inputs that allow a airplane simulator to fly in a realistic fashion under potentially conditions that have never been ha uh, happened before. So anyway, I thought that was kind of similar um, uh, type it of is. use of AI. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Cool. Well, so um, without further ado, uh, you know, I think you guys have done a really good job of setting up um, what we're trying to accomplish today. Um, you know, the way I talk about this general topic is we've set about you know, creating services and KPIs inside of ITSI. We found something that we want to monitor. Um, we've built the services and KPIs in order to model that thing. But at the end of the day, ITSI is a monitoring tool. And the purpose of a monitoring tool is to tell you that, you know, something is broken when it's actually broken. And ideally, to not tell you that it's broken when it's not broken, right? So we want to keep right. our false positives down and we want to keep our true positives up, right? And so what we're going to talk about today is how do we get from the services and the KPIs that we've built all the way to this point of, of actionable alerts. And um, I've used this visualization multiple times to describe the you know pipeline processing that we go through inside of ITSI to go from services and KPIs all the way to actionable alerts. So once we have our services and KPIs built, the first thing we're going to do is we are going to start to produce what we call notable events. You can think of these almost like alarms from an external monitoring tool. These are going to be situations in time, moments in time, where either a service or a KPI is exhibiting some sort of behavior that indicates that it's not healthy right now. Now, we have several different ways we can create notable events inside of ITSI. We can create correlation searches. We can turn on various types of KPI alerting, multi-KPI searches, that type of thing, right? So there's different ways to create notable events inside of ITSI. Once we get those notable events created, the very next thing we want to do is we want to try to group together as many logically related notable events as possible, because that's going to help us reduce the overall noise in the system and try to bring more context to the different alerts that are firing. OK, and so the way that we group notable events together inside of ITSI is by building notable event aggregation policies. And that produces grouped notable events that we call episodes inside of the product. And then once we have our episodes, we're pretty much ready to the point where we can say, OK, it's time to put this episode in front of somebody uh, because, you know, there's something about it that we want to you know, communicate. It's concerning enough that we want to get it in front of a human. Um, and we do that by building uh, action rules on the notable event aggregation policies to take whatever action we want to take, whether it's send an email or page out to 
you know, a paging system or flash the lights in the knock or whatever the heck we want to do. So um, you can see here that every one of these gray boxes represents different pieces of configuration inside of ITSI that we have to go do in order to make this processing pipeline happen. And I know what you're thinking. Um, what you, you know, you don't want to go and build these configurations yourself. And the short answer is you don't have to, okay? So we are going to rely upon a content pack uh, that is available for ITSI. Content packs are pre-built ITSI capabilities and functionality that kind of fast track uh, your time to value. We're gonna be focusing on, on the ITSI content pack for monitoring and alerting. And this content pack is actually going to put in the environment pre-built configurations for every um, one of these areas of, of, uh, you know, of build that we can simply just go turn on uh, in order to get from services and KPIs to actionable alerts. So we're gonna go ahead and get our hands on uh, with those um, correlation searches and with those configurations with the content pack. Um, but before we do that, we have to understand that if our KPIs are not thresholded well, then that is ultimately going to cascade towards more noisy alerts, right? So there's different capabilities that ITSI has to reduce uh, noise in the environment, but really there's no substitute for the importance of looking at the KPIs that you built, looking at the thresholds that you have tuned for those KPIs and making sure that they are correct. And if not, changing them and updating them um, so that you have more actionable alerts coming out on the back end. Okay. So I'll, just, so I'll just tell you the front, Jeff. I'm yep. I am reasonably certain we did a poor job of <laughs> setting some of these KPI thresholds. Because if I remember correctly, Kyle and I were trying feverishly to get a value for things like tire temp that was good and bad <laughs> based on Google searches. Uh, and I don't think we got I don't think we got there. So I think we'll have some data that will be easy for you to fix that. Yeah, yeah it's well, it'd be a lot of red. <laughs> and, and, and that problem doesn't really just extend to you guys and, and tire temperature. I mean, if you think about any uh, ITSI administrator who is building services and KPIs for uh, a service owner, oftentimes they have the same challenges, right? They don't know what normal is supposed to be, or they don't know exactly how to go and configure those thresholds right from the get-go. So this this concept of retroactively looking at the behavior of the environment and kind of improving it so that life is better moving forward is, is completely a best practice of ITSI um, that we're gonna walk through exactly how we do that today. Fantastic. All right. So as uh, we have talked about, just to reframe the challenge, we are going to use ITSI to tune KPIs and we're going to go focus on the important alerts uh, that are coming up. As a reminder, we have uh, folks working the chat channels. Uh, oh, we got the we got. So I see Pursuit Ops was able to join uh, properly. Uh, so we're going to be watching the Twitch uh, comments and we'll try to answer those live and in person here. And then if you are on our Discord, I point up because it's on a monitor up there, not like that means anything to y'all. Uh, but if you're on Discord, uh, I will do my best to, while we're uh, working through this, to answer questions and then bring those up. Um, all right. Cool, cool. All right. We ready to go, Kyle? Yeah. We ready to go, Jeff? Absolutely. It's time to get hacking, boys ready and girls. Hack? I got, my, got my screen. I'm ready, man. Oh, look, I could actually leave him up as a participant the entire time. <laughs> Uh, well, that just feels like the right thing to do. I mean, doesn't it? it? Like, just just if they're getting with it the whole time we're collaborative hacking. This will be fun. See if I we can focus. I can't <laughs> that possibly awesome allow that right. to happen. I'll have to share that gift later. Yes. Hey, are you guys so, are you guys done? Are you guys done gabbing? Let's get down to business. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> it's our last one, so we're trying to make it last as long as possible. We got a lot of do after we this. Got a, we got a lot of stuff to get through. Stop dilly dallying. <laughs> Fine. Yes, sir. By the way, the one thing we didn't cool. talk about with Jeff is Jeff is our uh, our resident ranter on our team, so he gets strong opinions and dialogues. Sometimes I'll call it monologuing. Uh, his best practices. So hopefully we get some of that that beauty going forward. I was told to keep 
I was told to keep it clean, so I'm doing my best. Yeah. All yeah. right. Remember so, where our family um, <laughs> That's right. That's right. Okay. So we're going to kind of start on the service analyzer screen, and this is really where we're going we're gonna to kind of set the stage for the activity that we have to do. So the service analyzer screen does a really good job of describing how the services and the KPIs are behaving right now. But when it comes to tuning thresholds and trying to understand how have my services and KPIs behaved, historically speaking, the service analyzer doesn't give us that information. And so to start this process of threshold tuning our KPI thresholds, what we really want to do is we want to try to look back at the behavior of the system over some period of time and try to find out which are the services and KPIs that look like they are exhibiting concerning behavior that might be an indication that they need to be uh, thresholded better. And so with the installation of the content pack for monitoring and alerting, and I'm going to ask Corey to go ahead and paste the hyperlink in the Slack um, or in the uh, in the chat for the uh, getting started with the content pack for monitoring and alerting. If you install this content pack into your environment, everything we do today, whether it's correlation searches or dashboards or ag policies or whatever, they're all going to be available to you. They're all present inside of that of that content pack. So, um, Kyle, let's start by opening up one of the dashboards that's present in the content pack called the ITSE um, Service and KPI Severity Analytics Dashboard. So let's click on Dashboards in our navigation. And then okay. one more time, click on Dashboards here. And that's going to load up all the dashboards in the environment. So um, if you look, you'll see that there is a, and I'm getting really close because, uh, let me see if I can make this a let little bit see, bigger. Hang, so. hang on a second. Let me try something. And Kyle, will you just make sure that in your settings that you're sharing at uh, 1080p? If it's, I, I don't know if it's. Yeah. Oh, no, I am not. So that will probably help here. Yeah. How about this? Oh, well, that's my video resolution. It, um, it actually just had an impact on the visibility here. So. Uh, oh, did it? That's good. Yeah. It, it made a pretty big impact. I don't know if everybody else saw that, but it, it went up. Okay. Um, cool. So uh, let's go ahead and find the dashboard called ITSE Service and KPI Severity Analytics. Okay. And Severity open that right up. There. That's it. All right. We'll click into that. Okay. Now, uh, this dashboard loads with what I would consider to be reasonably sane defaults, particularly for typical IT operations-based use cases. Um, what we want to do is we want to look at the behavior of our services and KPIs over some window of time. Um, it defaults to the last seven days, but we're going to go ahead and keep that time frame a little bit shorter. So for now, okay. let's just set our time picker to the last four hours. Last four hours. There we go. Perfect. All right. So um, what this dashboard is doing is it's looking at how the services and the KPIs have behaved from a thresholding perspective over the course of the last seven, um, sorry, the last four hours. And it's trying to surface up um, potentially concerning configurations based on, uh, you know, whether a threshold or sorry, whether a KPI has been um, you know, too high or too critical too often. Now, one of the things that I would recommend is we don't want to try to tune all of the thresholds in the environment at one time. We want to kind of scope our analysis down. And so using the service filter, the service name filter in the middle of your screen there, um, let's go ahead and um, Let's go ahead and search for the word Corey so that we can filter the KPIs down to just Corey's car. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> going across kind of the top middle of the screen there, we have several different um, single values. We have a 0%, 37%, 39%, 48%. 
zero percent again. What this is telling us is that the middle one says, hey, we have um, some KPIs in the environment that are uh, spending an excessive amount of time in an unhealthy state. So that might be an indication that we have some tuning to go do, right? So you can think of the middle portion of this dashboard as giving you a, a general overview as to what we're seeing in the environment. But right. each specific KPI that is having a problem um, is going to be listed here in the dashboard with the most concerning ones, generally speaking, uh, bubbling right up to the top. So gotcha. let's look at that very first row there. I see it says um, the KPI is the um, right front tire temperature, correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so we have here the reason for concern. So why was this KPI flag? Well, it, it, it fell into this category of being high or critical more than 10% of the time. And you can see here that it actually is um, critical 93% of the time. So if you just think about this logically, unless that KPI or unless that service is having a problem right now, it's probably unlikely that it should spend 95% of its time in a critical status. This is a strong right. indication that, um, you know, this KPI might not be thresholded correctly. So what we want to do or now I'm is just really, I'm just really ugly to my tires. That's, that's, yeah, you could, you, you, you could, you could be driving. a bad driver. That is possible. <laughs> They've seen the races. They know the proof. <laughs> so, let's dig in a little bit deeper on this KPI and let's try to understand how it's behaving. So if we click on that row in the, uh, in the table there, we're going to be driven deep into this particular KPI and, and all the information about it. Okay. So our time frame again, has carried forward from one dashboard to the other. So we're looking at this KPI's behavior over the last four hours. And you'll notice at the top of your screen, we have two pie charts that are sitting side by side. We have a pie chart on the left and we have a pie chart on the right. And right this moment, they look identical, right? We're gonna, mm -hmm. we're gonna fix that here in a second. You'll also notice that right below those pie charts, we have two different line charts on the bottom. One is on top and one is on the bottom. And once again, these things are looking identical. The purpose of this dashboard is to allow you to tune the KPI thresholds and interactively see how those changes in threshold values are going to impact that KPI moving forward. So the yeah. pie chart that you see on the left, that is never gonna change. This is, this is how this KPI has behaved in the past based on how it was thresholded in the past, okay? And same thing with the top line chart. So that's never gonna change. But as we so work like to before. this is the before <laughs> exactly. Gotcha. Okay. So as we work to incrementally improve the KPI thresholds for this particular KPI, that right side pie chart in the bottom line graph, those are going yep. to start to hopefully get a little bit better, right? Okay. All right. So probably a good time now, and this is a best practice when you're thresholding KPIs. We don't want to go changing threshold values until we understand why, like, what are we looking at? Why are we, why is the behavior of this KPI what it is? Right. If we think about the right front tire, this is, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Kyle, but when you guys built these services and KPIs initially, you kind of just did some basic static thresholds and all of the tires got the same thresholds, correct? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it was a lot of Googling and, and, and figuring out kind of what looked generally right. <laughs> but, you know, as I think through this, like, Corey's right front tire might look a bit different than my right front tire. And, and, and it's definitely going to look different than Blake Reynolds' right front tire. Easily. You know, <laughs> yeah. what, you know what just occurred to me too, Jeff, is as Kyle said earlier, the data set that we're looking at is mo most of the races that we've done as data drivers have been GT3 class uh, road, road road course races. And so we sort of expected pretty similar, you know, wear and temp across the tires. Cause in a road course, you have generally about as many lefts as you do. Right. Right. You're just generally speaking the the data set we're playing with here. This is from a NASCAR style race. This is when we were at Bristol 
in a super short track turning nothing but left. Yeah. That that and so now think about the law the physics of that, right? Front tires, rear tires. Your front tire as you're turning is the one that like the front right is the one getting absolutely annihilated. <laughs> like it's carrying all the turning pressure of the car every single turn. So the yeah, so, static static threshold would be useless. So it's expected. It's expected for the right front tire to be hotter than the rest, right? Correct. That's exactly yes. right. Right. And yep. so and, and and what we just did here is we just talked about we we looked at the behavior of the KPI. We talked about why it's behaving the way that it is. And we came to the conclusion that while this temperature is hotter than the other tires, it's probably normal, right? And so we have to go and change the thresholds to account for the fact that this tire is going to behave differently from the other tires on the car. And so I bring this up because we don't just want to blindly threshold KPIs. We don't just want to blindly change things so that everything looks normal. That's, that's, that's meaningless activity. What we want to do is we want to look at the behavior of the KPI. We want to understand why it's behaving the way that it is, have a conversation about it, and then based on what we believe is the right next step, okay, now we can go and tune the KPI and make it better, okay? Yeah. So right from this dashboard, we're giving you a hyperlink directly into the configuration for that KPI. So I see your mouse is over it right now, uh, Kyle. So yeah. go ahead and click right there on that blue hyperlink, and we're going to take you directly to the service build um, focused okay. in on this specific KPI. That way, now when we expand the thresholding tab, we know that we're modifying the thresholds for the for the Ooh. correct uh, KPI. Okay, and we yeah. can see here, uh, you know, based on the static thresholds that we chose, um, you know, this KPI is spending quite a bit of time in the red. We are not. We didn't do too hot on the right front <laughs> tire. You know, no, we yeah. we just blanketed all the tires together, not thinking right front probably changes a little different, especially track to track and driver to driver, right? Yeah, and, and what's really nice here is every tire is its own KPI in this particular service, which means that we can use uh, adaptive thresholding um, in, in, you know, per each of these KPIs in order to look at the historical uh, performance of this tire and use that as a baseline and we can then recompute the thresholds automatically using machine learning um, to uh, to account for what is normal versus not normal normal for this particular tire. Okay, so gotcha. we're gonna just kind of quickly go through that exercise of using adaptive thresholding to recompute the uh, threshold values for this KPI again using the historical um, data as a baseline for thresholds moving forward. So okay. in order to use adaptive thresholding, we're gonna just click the enable time policies um, okay. check box there, yep. And then once we do that, now you can see, I can see here that I'm looking at the behavior of this KPI over you know multiple days, multiple hours, multiple days. And now I can click enable adaptive thresholding. So okay. what I'm gonna do really quick is I'm gonna walk you guys through a couple of um, good solid default choices. There's still yeah. some configuration, even though we're using machine learning to baseline the KPI, um, there are still some configuration changes that we have to make. And generally speaking, um, seven days for a training window is a good look back time. So we're gonna keep that exactly as is. And okay. then if you scroll down to configure threshold time policies, go ahead and expand that. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Now you'll notice that um, our policy type is static. Okay. And let's go ahead and drop that down. And I would highly recommend standard deviation. So if you're, um, we do have a couple other algorithms in there, but for reasons that I'm not going to talk about now, uh, but I will talk about uh, at dot conf, standard deviation is the right choice to make. So we're going to go ahead and do that. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna set um, multiple different tiers. Uh, so we, we do want the KPI to go you know, to medium high and ultimately critical. So go ahead and click that add threshold button three times, one for high, one for um, medium and one for, yep, perfect. And then go ahead and make medium uh, critical. You got it. 
high and then normal. Great. Now what we're doing here is when we go and we set the, um, the configuration parameters, we are actually set setting it to how many um, standard deviations away from the mean do we want to, um, you know, do we want to make something critical at? And, and um, again, there's some really good solid default choices that we're going to recommend that you guys do. Um, for the purpose of this hackathon, we're going to have critical at 1.5. We're going to have high at one and we're going to have medium at 0 0.5. And so, so like a, if you look at like a bell curve, this plays into where they play, right? Yes. We'll yes, it does. And again, I, I actually almost want to gloss over that because what we've found in working with so many different customers is there, there are really just some, there are some, simple choices that you can make from a configuration perspective that work really well across a wide range of KPIs. And you don't need to be a statistician in order to, you know, fill in the blank and yeah. get it and get your uh, thresholds pretty good. So cool. once we have those populated, go ahead and click apply adapted thresholding and watch what happens. So what's happening is, is under the covers, ITSI is going back and looking at the historical baselines and it is computing what the new threshold should be moving forward. And look at that. You can see that the vast majority of this KPI has moved into the normal range um, yeah. because once again, this is a normal value, a normal temperature for this particular tire. You know, it's funny, and here, here's some more context about this data. What just happened, because this is from my car, um, during that race, if you go back and watch, I had towards the end of the race, I had a spot where I spun out and the car like came to a complete stop in the grass. And that literally, that high tire temperature right there, I bet is literally that point where I spun out. I, it got too hot. I spun. The car, you can clearly see the temperature come way down and go back into a baseline. And at some point, I think that where it drops off there is the end of the race. And then that's when the next race started again, because we have the data kind of streaming back and forth. So it's like it literally is connected to an event that happened in, you know, in the race that now we're going to capture that, uh, which is actionable. Um, so kind of cool. kind of uh, going back to what Blake said, we you could have had an alert there and maybe uh, kept you from spinning out a bit. Yeah, exactly. Like lift just a little bit in this turn and maybe you're not going to have that spin event. So, yeah. So I do oh, want to just man. say we had a which is cool. That's data to action, right? That's literally why we're here. Yeah. Um, I just want to say thanks to uh, Nuno Henriquez uh, that was uh, posted over in the Twitch channel um, and just said he, he's actually an esports driver for Lotima Racing Team, um, oh, cool. which they compete. I think he's competing maybe this weekend in the, uh, the 24 Hours of Le Mans uh, that's being hosted because their real life one is happening, but also they're, they've got one, I think, happening soon. Um, but at any rate, uh, he, he said that this is – uh, solving problems that, you know, racing teams and esports teams don't have today, which is a central place to store the data. Um, and one thing I, I'd respond and said, you know, hey, we hear you. But the, the thing for, for me and, and for Kyle, when we've been talking with Blake and Tobin is like, we also have to think about not only like, how do we get this stuff out of iRacing? And we'll talk about one of the things we're going to talk about at .conf and our kind of future plans is, yeah, how do we help sim racing teams that go cross-platform have mm. a similar sort of ability to send data from all platforms into a single data plat, you know, from all gaming, re you know, platforms and stuff into a single data platform that we can then normalize and have similar things like we're building here that right front tire here in iRacing translates to the same thing as I have right front tire in a set of Corsa or right front tire yeah. in F1 2021, something like that, right? Which is and all then, future work and not, not impossible. It just takes time. Well, and then it's a repeatable process. So like somebody could come back and watch Jeff and Jeff isn't having to learn anything new or do anything new. The end user can then use exactly this. And it's absolutely relatable to whatever platform you're using in your sim racing. Yeah. That's, that's cool. Very yeah. cool. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt, Jeff. Thank you. No, no, it's awesome stuff. Um, okay. So let's go ahead and click save now that we've gone and computed uh, the adaptive threshold values. And what I want you to do next, Kyle, is I want you to go back to the dashboard that we had open, that KPI. And now go ahead and refresh the, uh, the browser page and watch what happens. Oh, as I said before, the left side is going to stay oh. static. 
and the right side now is interactively improving, right? So now we can see how much better we have made the threshold values for this KPI. So and that, let's magic. let's make that let's make that real, Jeff. So like literally, what happened? You know, if, for those of you who aren't familiar with the way maybe some alerting systems work, like in, in monitoring tools like this, every time an alert fires, there can be actions that get taken. Like we showed uh, in some cases, like we built alerts for every time a tire went over a certain temp to send an email. Well, what you see here is in this green area, that's just a whole bunch of emails that aren't going to have to be sent that aren't really useful, that don't give you any action. You're getting down to those things that are critical alerts that require human intervention, right? It's time for a human to do something differently to cause this. So it's, it's literally quieting the noise. It's taking all the, the busyness out of it and going, here's what's important. That's, I think that's mm -hmm. a big deal. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, cool. going back to what Blake said, right. To have a fourth screen sitting above him that flashes purple. Well, if it's constantly flashing purple, he's He'll just going to turn it off. <laughs> right. So, yeah. but this, it's a bit more useful for, him. okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm picking awesome. up what you're putting yeah, down, Jeff. I like cool, it. Cool, cool, cool. I'm glad. Jeez, All right, so, <laughs> so um, we're gonna tr we're gonna shift gears towards the alerting side. But what we just went over is Let's we just talked do, about right? how do I how do I understand the performance of my thresholds uh, across a wide range of services and KPIs in the environment, and then how do I take steps interactively. Uh, in order to tune those and make them better. This is a very important exercise that that you know we need to do because if our thresholds aren't good, that is ultimately going to cascade into more alert noise and ultimately less uh, actionable alerts. So for now, we're good on uh, this particular dashboard. We can close this out and let's kind of segue into the the other stuff we were talking about in um, Let's go back to the service analyzer. Okay, perfect. So we'll segue to the other stuff we we're talking about at the at the uh, you know beginning when we we're setting up the hackathon activity. So mm -hmm. now our service tree is it's it's telling us the truth, right? It's green when things are healthy. It's red, yellow, and orange when things are unhealthy. And so how do we then take the next step of taking action, right? We don't want to sit here looking at the service analyzer screen all the time. We want to flash the big purple things or send the notifications to your Apple Watch or whatever, right? So right. that's really the next step. So if you remember back to the image where I had kind of the, the pipeline of going from services and KPIs all the way to actionable alerts, the first thing that we need to do is we need to create notable events when our services and KPIs are unhealthy. And okay. I also said that if you install the content pack for monitoring and alerting, we're going to just give you those configurations right out of the box inside of ITSI. There's nothing you have to do except for turn them on. And that's exactly what we're going to do now. So go ahead to configure uh, and um, do configuration and correlation searches. This is the part of the product that allows us to continuously scan for bad stuff and create notable events when they occur. So go ahead with your filter and zoom in to just the service monitoring correlation searches. These are the ones that are pre-built to look at only service and KPI behavior, which is what we're focused in on today. So there's two uh, correlation searches that we're going to enable. The first one is KPI degraded. So I actually just want you, Kyle, alone to do this. For anybody that's following along, um, we're yeah. all in the same environment. So I don't want everybody to try to click the enable button on this correlation search. Uh, but um, so go ahead and enable the KPI degraded correlation search. And this is going to um, uh, go back. It was actually just a, uh, a little. Oh, that was uh, my bad. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. So this is going to, once we turn this on and enable this search, it's going to just begin creating notable events. Uh, it's uh, the uh, status on the right-hand side of your screen. You can just oh, go from- Oh, right here. Yep, yeah, okay. There you go. So, um, yep, go ahead and enable that. And just like that, anytime, anytime a KPI uh, goes healthy, this correlation search is gonna see that and create a notable event. And then the other thing that we wanna understand it's critically important is we want to know when a 
KPI goes from unhealthy back to normal because that gives us even more information about um, what's going on with our car. So go ahead and turn on the degraded service or KPI returns back to normal. These and are going to give just us me doing that, right? That's correct. Looking at you, Ryan Plass. <laughs> If everybody person. refreshes their correlation search screen right now, everybody will see that these correlation searches have been enabled in the environment. Um, so it's really just one person has to do it. All cool. right. So just like that, with two clicks of a, of a button, we are now creating notable events for any uh, KPI that is uh, unhealthy and then also putting, uh, you know, creating KPIs when those things return back to normal. So that's great. That would produce still uh, a decent amount of, of, uh, of noise if we can't consolidate those notable events together. So the idea of grouping notable events together is what the notable event aggregation policies uh, configuration does. So we're going to take the next step to, um, um, to actually configuring how to group these different notable events together. So go ahead and click on configuration and then notable event aggregation policies. Okay. So again, with the content pack for monitoring and alerting, there are several different aggregation policies that are, um, that are present by default in, in, the, uh, uh, in the content pack. And the one we're gonna focus in on today is episodes by ITSI service. So let's go ahead and enable that. Now, what this does is it's going to take all of those notable events that are starting to be generated and it is going to logically group them together in what I call two dimensions, two dimensions of grouping. OK, the first one is we're going to group across time. So, you know, we all have those monitoring tools that produce over and over again. Uh, you know, this the tire is hot. The tire's hot, the tire's hot, the tire's still hot. And those, every one of those is another alert, right? And that in and of itself can produce a tremendous amount of volume. So the first thing that the aggregation policies in ITSI is doing is it's grouping together across time. So we're grouping in the time dimension. But we are also grouping in a second dimension, which is we are going to bundle together the alerts for the left tire and the right tire and the front tires and back tires and the, and the engine temperature, all because it's all associated to the same car. The car is the thing we care about, right? That's the entity that we want to measure yeah. the health of. So now we're grouping all of the notable events together by that ITSI service, or in this particular case, by that car. So we're achieving a tremendous amount of uh, uh, noise reduction in the environment by grouping our alerts together across multiple different dimensions. Gotcha. OK. That ah, makes sense. Ah, yeah. Pretty cool, huh? Time sure. and related. Yeah. That. But it also has to be more efficient on the back end, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, it certainly is. So um, that's a, that's a completely true. So now let's figure out how we go and we, we want to go see this in action, right? Otherwise, nobody's going to believe me. So where is it inside of ITSI um, where we can see these grouped notable events together? Uh, and that is under the alerts and episodes tab. So go ahead and click there. All right. Now, for those of you that are following along, um, you uh, there's a couple of things about this view that I want to show you. So right this moment, this view is not rendering any results. You might see some results on your screen. Um, Kyle, go ahead in the upper left hand corner of the screen. There's a little uh, arrow right there. You're hovering over it right now. I want everybody to click on that. What this is going to do is this is going to fly out a couple of different um, saved episode views. So you can think of a saved episode view as just a set of filters around the types of episodes that we want to see and the statuses that they're in. Um, and so what we all, what I want everybody to do is go ahead and click on that new uh, episodes dash new untriaged. Okay. That is going to show us. Yep. Go ahead and click on that and hit yes. That is going to show us all of the 
uh, episodes in the environment. And again, an episode is just one of those logically, you know, is, is just a, a logical grouping of notable events. And because we just enabled these correlation searches, we may not see anything yet. Um, but if you change your time picker from the last 24 hours to the last seven days, um, we, we had this environment configured. Uh, oh, look, it's gonna make, a, gonna make a liar out of us. What the heck? Wah, wah. You know, there you go. This is what happens when we put Kyle back in the garage. <laughs> you know, we were having smooth sailing. Uh, very go ahead and confident. That. Let me uncheck, take control. So and this is where go, we get. Go ahead really quick and um, uh, use your, uh, your arrow there to do another saved episode view. Let's try episodes all. There we go. All right. There we go. So here we have a new, um, we have a new episode. Uh, for uh, Kyle's car. Okay, so go ahead and click on that. All right, and now we are now we're drilled into a specific episode, which is going to be a group of of um, uh, logically related alerts, and we can see as we move across. So the right hand side of the screen, this is showing you a lot of information about uh this particular episode about this particular grouping of alerts we can see uh the impact tab is going to tell us what services what itsi services are are part of um are part of this episode what kpis were specifically identified within this episode you can you can use the analyze and deep dive uh to actually drive right out to a custom deep dive for just the services and KPIs in the search. So everything about this particular view, whether it's the impact tab or the events timeline tab or the common fields, et cetera, they're all geared towards giving you as much information as you can heads up uh, about this particular episode so that you can more effectively triage it. Go ahead really quick and uh, change your uh, time frame from, from the last 24 hours. I want to go find an episode that has a few more notable events in it for so the last Hack, seven days. Hack Daddy Dutra just uh, posted up there that he went back 10 days. He was able to uh, uh, to see it. So let's see some other things in the new untriaged. Just FYI. And thank you for just that. Just FYI. Hack Daddy. Shall we try that, Jeff? Yep, it's perfect. Oh, cool. there we go. Hey now, nice. Looks like you're filling out. So, let's go ahead and do. Um, oh yeah, they're starting to pop. Yep. So you can pick any one that has you know several different uh, um, you know notable events in it. I see, say uh, like that car Simon right below that with forty two. Yeah. Go ahead and click on that guy. Yep. Go ahead and click on that. All right. So again. We're looking at the impact tab. My favorite view, the one that I think tells the, the most compelling story is actually the event timeline. That's the next tab over. Do you see in the middle of your screen? Yep, go ahead and click on the event timeline. So what this is showing you is, this is showing you all of those alerts that have been grouped together uh, in the time dimension. So because they're all on one single swim lane here, this is telling us this is the same alert and it's firing over and over and over again. Um, we're just yeah. grouping them together across time. And you remember I said we can also group it in a second dimension. That would show up as multiple rows. If we had other alerts associated with this particular um, service, we would have other alerts or other rows in this event timeline. Let's go ahead just uh, and click on the car Corey um, right above this one. And let's see if we have an episode that has multiple alerts in it. So we can see how we can group across that second dimension. Yep, we sure are here. So we're seeing tire temp issues for the right front tire. We're seeing tire temp issues for uh, the right rear tire. So we're, we're, we're showing you grouping of alerts in multiple different dimensions here. Um, and again, yeah. the impact tab tells you what's impacted on and on and on. That's wow. fantastic. And I also noticed there that you can do things like, you can see, you know, the activity comments that are being made. Um, you could even land here like the, in the instructions, like if this is something common, you know, that, that you would, you know, shows up, you can actually have instructions on how to triage and deal with said event 
uh, or episode sort of embedded there natively so that people maybe that don't know how to configure this, at least if they had this sort of capability configured and they were going, oh, I see something red, I got I to gotta drill in, it can give you next best guidance on action uh, to really help you remediate the issue as rapidly as possible. And there's abilities to do things like, you know, in IT, you know, configure this to uh, integrate with ServiceNow, you know, ticket population, that kind of stuff. So lots of opportunity there uh, to uh, to make people's lives easier. That's pretty cool. Yep, you can you can manage the entire life cycle of the incident right here uh, through uh, status changes and assignment and things like that. Or as you said, uh, Corey, you can integrate with an external ticketing system and use that to manage the uh, the life cycle of this ticket in a in a bi directional fashion. So there's a lot of things that you can do. Um, once you start getting episodes created, the the pr the most important functionality that ITSI is uniquely suited to deliver is that ability to group those different notable events across multiple different dimensions, so that you can reduce the noise and get greater context as to what's going on all from one view. That is really slick, man. Yeah, this is super cool, and I can see where it can be helpful just all over the board. So have we done it, Jeff? Did we did we tune the KPIs? We, we tuned the KPIs. We turned on the notable events to begin, um, <clears throat> you know, producing uh, uh, notable events when problems happen, and then we started bundling them together uh, to reduce noise and ultimately take that uh, action to, you know, to uh, you know, flag the Apple Watch or turn the lights uh, purple or or send the email or whatever it is you want to do. Well, fantastic, buddy. Well, Jeff, that was uh, very insightful. And uh, one, I want to call out again that it's in the notes, um, but this wouldn't, a lot of this is uh, thanks to a lot of the work that Jeff has done to help steer our product in a great direction. And the uh, monitoring learning uh, app and add-on or add-on is, uh, excuse me, content pack, fantastic piece of technology to help make our lives easier. So Jeff, thank you so much for joining us for the hackathon today. And uh, folks, I, you know, thanks for the action on uh, on chat hopefully you were able to get hands-on and if you weren't hands-on in the lab at least you saw some interesting capabilities from Splunk applying thresholds at speed so we really focus on data to action and Kyle I just about you being the problem you are absolutely not the problem I want to say a big thank you to you buddy you've been uh, I know working tirelessly to make this happen um, and people should know that you're uh, you're awesome so uh, with that I want to say if you are interested in more fun with Jeff Wiedemann we call him the weed man uh, not because of anything weird, but his name sort of looks like Weedman. Uh, he's got a tech talk that's recorded called Tuning KPI Thresholds that goes through this in detail, but not in the context of racing, but more in the context of, you know, actual uh, IT uh, use cases. So if you're an IT practitioner looking to do that, we'll drop the link in chat. Kyle, would, do you mind grabbing the link and throwing the chat for me? Um, and then if you want to get that content pack for monitoring and alerting and get that installed, there's a link there as well. And, uh, much like, uh, Kyle and I, we are excited about .conf and Jeff actually has two talks happening at .conf, but he's got a great one talking in detail about best practices for adaptive thresholding that you should absolutely check out. And we've got a link there. I, I would just be remiss if I didn't plug that. I mean, I, over and over again, I run across uh, customers who, don't understand exactly, you know, how adaptive thresholding works. And as a result, they don't get the configurations right. And so uh, in this comp talk, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to completely um, expose exactly how it works under the covers. So everybody walks away with a general understanding of it. And perhaps more importantly, I'm going to tell you exactly the configurations that you need to use uh, across most of your KPIs in order to uh, get really um, valuable adaptive thresholding results out. So uh, if, if you are an ITSI administrator um, or you're uncertain about how that adaptive thresholding works, this is um, critical information that's never been shared before. So I'm really excited about this talk. Fantastic. Well, that's the great thing about .conf. There's always new cool things, but let's be honest, we're not the only ones building new cool stuff. We know you all are capable and awesome of building cool things. And that's your homework uh, this time is if you build something cooler than we did as part of data drivers, continue to post that stuff on Twitter, Instagram, wherever you post your social media. Um, we'd appreciate it. We take inspiration from you all. The things that you say in the chat, uh, give us ideas to track down and to you know, test and learn. Um, and, and I just want to say, 
an enormous thank you to you participants who joined us on this journey. Hopefully you learned some things. I hope you had some fun. Um, and hopefully you'll come back and hang out with us some more and you can hang out with us in person. I cannot let you go without telling you register for .conf. It's going to be awesome. Kyle, Jeff, and I will all be there in person. Uh, and if you can't join in person, lots of opportunities for you to join things virtually, but that is happening in Las Vegas, October 18th through 21st register at conf.splunk.com. And when you get your email after you've registered, whether virtual or in person, you're going to get an email that's going to give you a link to register for the boss of ops and observability at .conf. Go ahead and register. Like I said, we've got fantastic uh, new content that's actually going to get you hands on with data drivers and two fun episodes. Um, but there's also a bunch of other really great episodes around IT operations, um, site reliability, engineering activities, and DevOps uh, sort of use cases that I think you all will get a kick out of. And they're totally new. They're being completely revamped. So even if you played boss of the knock in the past, you've participated in a boo so far this year. Great. You haven't seen this. So definitely tune in. You're going to have a good time with us. And if you liked data drivers, uh, which we hope you did, uh, you're going to really like .conf because we are going to have a big presence at .conf. We're going to have this thing called the data playground. And I'm not going to give you all the breakdown. There's going to be a ton of fun ways to get your hands on something that's a real life activity uh, that's you know fun of, across a bunch of different areas of interest. One of those is going to be uh, sim, sim racing. And we're going to have uh, eight sim rigs on the floor where you can actually, if you, if you haven't been able to come racing with us because you don't have one, we're going to have awesome ones there. We're going to have dashboards showing all the data, hands-on demos. We've got a breakout session that'll recap what we did in data drivers and really focus in on the technical learnings uh, that we took away and that we hope people took away from uh, participating. But there's also going to be uh, two cool things I want to clue you in on. We're going to have some live streamed racing action. So those folks who compete and go drive the simulators while they're at .conf, they're going to have a chance to uh, to be entered in a race. Uh, both the folks that are in person and folks virtually attending will have a chance to race against uh, some of us Splunkers for a uh, live streamed race uh, towards the end of .conf. And then we're working on it right now, but there's going to be a Big Data Beard video series called Talk Fast, Turn Left. We're, we're going to, it's going to be really fun. We're going to, we're going to strap a bunch of you folks who have been on data drivers with us, all you racers, we're going to invite you to come racing with us because we want a bunch of cars on track, but it's going to be a NASCAR style race. And we're going to strap a Splunk executive or a partner or somebody interesting and cool that we want to talk to into a seat. And we're going to host a race for 30 minutes. And there's going to be one or two people each race that they're going to have to drive in the race and talk to us at 200 miles an hour. So we're having 200 mile, 200 mile an hour conversations leading up to dot conf October 11th through the 15th. So check that out. It's going to be called talk fast, turn left. It should be a lot of fun. I'm really excited about it. Kyle, I see you smiling. I think you're excited. <laughs> Mostly you're just making it. It's, it's, it's NASCAR. Yeah. It's, be, it's NASCAR. So it's going to be, uh, you know, the Americans I mean, love it. It's going to be good. Who doesn't love it? Yeah. You know? It's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> it's going to be fun. <laughs> Well, as I said, uh, one, thank you all for joining us. Kyle, Jeff, thank you for being here. And to all of our, our guest subject matter experts, i just say a huge thanks. It wouldn't be possible without you. And uh, I just want to remind you, whatever you're into, be data-driven and join Data Drivers. We'll see you. <laughs>